Hi, this is Thierry Lemaire of Nuance Winery Supplies, located in France slash Ontario. Hi, this is Louise Amphit of Radio USA, located in Santa Rosa, California. And you are listening to Side Chat. Episode 131. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Aria Wincoller and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week, it's all about cider barrel maintenance. We'll be speaking with three professionals in this arena. There'll be more on that, but first, some news out and about in Ciderville. Last week, I was on a cider tour in Ontario with a host beyond host. His name is Ryan Monkman, and he is the person behind Field Bird Cider. If you get a chance to follow this guy on Instagram, if you have never used Instagram, if you want to follow like one person, follow Ryan. He is so positive, uh, comes into the cider realm with so much joy and passion and knowledge. So what happened is Ryan uh, contacted me a couple weeks ago and said, Rhea, you know, let's get you up here to Ontario. And so we worked that out, and he essentially sponsored this trip. So you'll be hearing a lot about that because I really want to give kudos to Ryan for being someone who is thinking out of the box. You know, the in the industry, in the beverage industry, if you want to get folks to know about your product, you have to get people like myself or other riders on board and out there into the field. And that's exactly what we did. This was a field tour beyond my wildest expectations. Uh, one, hanging out with Ryan Monkman is just a blast. And if you want to hear a bit about that, you could go to the Cider Chat Live podcast, which is a, a mini-me of this here main podcast. And there is an episode number four called Cider Meetups in Ontario with Ryan. And it'll give you a glimpse into his background and his passion. I have a number of chats coming up with Ryan, so stay tuned for that. But this one will give you a little glimpse. It's about, uh, I don't know, a little over 15 minutes long. I had a lot of fun kind of pulling off little sound bites, if you will, from our trip. Because I was, I was in another parallel universe from my own. It began by a drive, a, actually a very delightful drive, going over the border at Niagara Falls. And I did post a little video while I was at Niagara Falls on the Canadian side. It was hot. I'll tell you, June, it could be hot up there and humid. It was all I could do to not melt like an ice cream cone on the sidewalk. <laughs> But you could see the water. The water is just so powerful coming over Niagara Falls. And you could see Horseshoe Falls, too. And it was a happening tourist scene. So I landed there and that evening met up with, with Ryan. And you're going to hear that main chat that we had that evening with both Ryan, Thierry, and Lewis. All on cider barrels, oak barrels, and all the details that I've been just hankering to find out. I'll be following up again on more barrel chatter with Ryan and his good friend and cohort down in the barrel room, Lee, who is the winemaker at Kenty Winery up in Prince Edward County. So this is, I'm giving you a lot of info. You're going to have to keep up with me because we now are into another realm, a kind of a parallel universe from the U.S., but not... And I'm going to try to do my best to try to explain what I'm seeing, but I think you'll get the most out of it by just listening to the makers themselves, and I'll be filling in the gaps a bit. One of the key things that I think should be heard is this little piece from Dan, who was serving cider and wine at the Niagara College Visitor Center, where you could go and actually purchase wine and cider. And this is what he has to say right now about the climate and the customers coming in to this facility. Yeah. People come here for cider now, which is really nice. Because yeah. it's like they come in the door. And I don't know the divide, but it's like you walk in and they're like, uh, is this cider? They always have this like quizzical look on their faces. But yeah, I got okay. one more for you to try. I just ran out of it, but I got a bottle open. 
They are running out of cider at the tasting room here because so many people are walking the door asking about cider, what it is, trying to understand it. In fact, now Niagara College is offering a cider making course in addition to winemaking, brewing, and they have a distillery they're setting up. So this is a, a great place to go and study your courses. And in fact, we had a wonderful conversation with Gavin, who is a winemaker there, and he'll be talking about the program and also his own cider brand called Garage Door. Uh, so that was a, a kind of an eye-opener for me. One is kind of be hanging out in this two simultaneous cultures, which is an integration in one realm of wine and cider fully, at a level that I haven't really seen in the U.S. Um, and maybe I haven't hung out in Napa or Sonoma. I will definitely cop to that or the Finger Lakes. I'm open to an invitation, of course. <laughs> but what I saw in Canada uh, knocked my socks off because it was so integrated and there was such a crossover of knowledge, which I think really helps makers, such as in the topic that we're talking about today with barrels. And I talked a lot about this with, with Ryan in that, where do you learn how to manage a barrel? Well, you know, you have this option of going to a winery and really working in, in that setting with barrels. And then it's kind of passed down through that trade. But in the cider realm, there's not a big focus on barrel management and maintenance and the selection. And that's that's been a big question for me because I've always been interested in barrels themselves. So that fact that they have so many people in the wine industry who have a lot of long-term lineage connections to the oak barrel realm really helps up their game overall. So that was quite, quite interesting for me. That evening after we left Niagara College, we had dinner, and that's a conversation you're going to be hearing tonight with Ryan and Thierry and Lewis. Um, these guys are super technical, and I try to keep it very basic because, well, that's the level I'm at, and just trying to get that info out to both makers and non-commercial makers alike. The next morning, we met up with Richard Liu, who is the chairman of the Ontario Craft Cider Association. And so we talked a bit about that. That'll be an upcoming conversation. He's also the owner and president of Sunnybrook Winery and the Ironwood Cider brand. And if you were in uh, Michigan recently and you met Antonella, she works at Ironwood up in Ontario. So that was delightful. Uh, later on that afternoon, we made our way out to Hartwood Cider, who I hadn't met since I recorded a little mini chat with Brent at CiderCon. And wouldn't you know, what a small world. Here I was, you know, months ago, kind of passing by and saying, oh, I want to have a Canadian li little mini chat. And next thing you know it, now I am sitting at their kitchen table, which is like the hub, the center of Hartwood Cidery's universe. This is a, a working farm. And sitting with Kat, who I just had hung out as a steward at Glencap with, and then got to meet more fully Brent and Val. The three of them had been at CiderCon, but I didn't really get to know them. And to share food with them, basically break bread and meet their kids and parents. They were gearing up for Ontario Craft Cider Week, which was hap happening actually right now, uh, was, was just... Uh, a treasure that I'll never forget. So there'll be an upcoming chat with them. And while we're hanging out there, well, Mark Skinner walks in from Windswept Cidery. This is another Ontario-based cidery, and he's kind of scrumping apples and working with neighbors, so there'll be a little mini chat with him also. So this, this fusion of all these people that Ryan has brought together, at this point, not showcasing his own cider, just showcasing Ontario. That says a lot about this guy. Mr. Monkman, and what he's, he is doing. He's really a visionary for the cider industry in Canada um, and someone that you don't see coming across your path very often, someone who's so passionate, so positive, and really stepping out and financing something for so many other people. Uh, that's just amazing to me. So we ended there. Ryan and I slowly made our way back, and I met up with him the next day in Prince Edward County.
Prince Edward County is north of Lake Ontario. The shores of Lake Ontario lap upon the shores of Wellington and Wellington Beach. It is a magnificent region. And this is land of many cideries, uh, has a long history of apple production, and we are seeing a real uptick in this region. The next morning, we're up early, Ryan and I, heading up to his good friends, Case and Margaret, who own Kings Mill Cidery. And you'll hear a little bit about how Ryan was talking about the first opening and there was an ice storm. They had to reset the date for the opening and he and his wife, Nicole, were driving up to go see Kings Mill to see if anybody was going to be coming to the opening that had been changed around. And lo and behold, it was packed to so much so that the person who was hired to park cars, a local neighbor, was going to help out, walked away after like, I don't know, probably a half hour saying, there's just too many cars, I can't handle with it, which is part and parcel of this region. It's just so, uh, I guess it would say, you would say that the community spirit is just, it's palatable and contagious, which there's nothing better than that. And then we stopped on the way back at Apple Falls Cider. I met Matt Oskamp, who is the cider maker there. He and Amelia Campbell are really making it happen at her family's apple farm and orchard. So there's going to be a uh, chat coming up with both Matt and Emily's father, Colin Campbell. And that will be one really to uh, listen to also. Very interesting history there and what they're doing with apples. And I really like Colin's take on the world and, um, and heritage in general. So stay tuned for that. In the afternoon, we uh, met up for a beer, and I got to meet for the first time Deanna Way. She is known on Instagram as That Cider Girl, really lovely woman who is taking on writing about cider in Canada. i wishing wishing her the best of luck. What a landscape to be able to cover. And then that evening, we met up with both Sarah and Gary, who are transplants from Canada to Texas and back home again, and they're starting a cidery. They're actually breaking ground this week, maybe today, while the podcast is going live for a brand new cidery that's going to have a cellar room in Prince Edward County uh, in Wellington. So this whole whole configuration of people just on the cutting edge of cidery startups in Ontario is phenomenal. And before I forget, uh, the name of the cidery for Gary and Sarah is called Settlers. Go to Settlers.com. Look at the logo of that cidery, the apple tree with the Celtic marking for the the canopy of the apple tree. It's really worth seeing. So much brilliance going on everywhere up in Ontario. It's really inspiring for me. I bid adieu to Ryan that evening and on the next day set out on my own journey and stopped into a cidery that was really on my to-go list, and that was to meet Jennifer Dean of County Cider Company, uh, again on Prince Edward County, which is essentially an island, an island mass uh, on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And Jennifer and I did a recording at this exquisitely situated cidery that has a lot of history, much akin to West County Cider in Western Massachusetts. Um, And so wait for that. Uh, It's a really amazing story and what a powerhouse of a woman that Jennifer Dean is. I'll be really excited to get that out to you. So there's a long list of recordings to bring to you. Again, a big, big high five to Ryan Monkman, who I know will be hearing a lot more, not only on these subsequent episodes, but I hope to bring in his knowledge and wisdom and enthusiasm to Cider Chat for other episodes along the way. So let's take a little break here, and when we come back, we'll be heading to our main conversation that we had over dinner on oak barrels and how you can get your cider in there and how one must maintain and continue to build skills with oak and cider.
Ladies, to bring to you a conversation I had over dinner with Ryan Monkman of Field Bird Cider, and we did enjoy a very fine bottle of his cider with this meal. And also, Louis Zenville from Radu, which is a cooperage. It's both based in Santa Rosa, California, which is in Northern California, and has different, I guess you would say, almost affiliate or locations also around the world. So he's coming from a cooperage perspective, or a cooper's perspective on barrels. And then there is Thierry Lemaire, who is, uh, well, how could you describe him? He's been in the wine industry for a long time. He oversees nuances. There'll be a link to the show notes uh, to that business. And that provides lots of services to the wine industry. Both gentlemen, or all three gentlemen, have a very large background in wine. And what they have been watching is the cider industry take off, which is an open market. So, of course, they have interest in what's going on with cider, just as on my side, I have interest in the technology that comes from wine and how it can articulate to cider. And in this case, particularly with barrels, oak barrels. So I'm going to be bringing along some basic questions, some questions that were brought out from listeners of Cider Chat, and I'll bring you next to this dinner that we had in St. Catherine in Ontario, a lovely city on the south shore of Lake Ontario in Canada. What you have to understand with the barrels is uh, you can talk to Radu and you can talk to any other um, cooper. What you're trying to do as a maker winemaker, cider maker, beer maker, you know, it's just what you're trying to do to achieve is finding the right vessel that is going to feed your wine or cider. So the questions initially when people are talking about barrels is, okay, what kind of barrel do you have and what kind of impact that barrel is going to have on my wine or my cider or my beer um, or my whiskey or bourbon or whatever. Right. So basically you have to understand the profile of the barrels and every single cooper we have a range of barrels with low impact, medium impact, high impact of oak tenons, uh, of the toast. You can, you have so many parameters in that barrel that the range, I mean, uh, I think if I'm not saying something wrong, in San Rosa, which is where we produce the barrels in the US for the Redu, mm-hmm. if you combine all different kinds of oak, um, the origins, uh, the seasoning, the different toasts, mm-hmm. the different options, you can have about 165 different profiles. Out of that one barrel? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's what so you're, you're doing formats, specifically. Or, yeah. yeah. So that's what we do. So if you choose you know, a 225 liter versus a 228 versus a 300, if you choose French oak versus American oak, if you want to take Minnesota oak versus a Polynesian oak, if you take a medium toast or a medium plus, if you choose, if you want to have toasted heads yeah. versus untoasted heads, I mean, the options are endless. So right. the question that we have when we start the competition with somebody is always, about the product itself and what kind of goal you want to achieve. This is our role, this is our job to Mm -hmm. understand what he's looking for in the range because they don't know what we do. They don't, they're they're not going to pick a barrel like you pick something on the menu right here. You can pick here right now, uh, you know, you want to pick the ribeye steak and you know it's going to be comfy oysters, mushroom, crispy onion rings and chimichurri and all of that. It's here, it talks to you, you know what it is. Um, and then you're going to choose, you know, if you want a medium rare or something like that. But in a barrel, when you've never tried a barrel, you can, I can write a lot of things on the paper, but how it's going to feed your wine or your cider or your beer mm-hmm. is a totally different question. And how you're going to use it is also the same thing. Are you going to age your product in the barrel for six months, 12 months, mm-hmm. 18 months? Mm-hmm. So all of those parameters, mm-hmm. it's basically where we have people like Thierry coming on, you know, on board and saying, okay, I have the experience, but you, have to, you need to taste a lot of barrels, a lot of wine, a lot of different alcohol to really understand all the impact. And then even if you have all that experience, um, you need to travel a lot because I'm pretty sure it's the same thing with cider. But in the wine, a cab a Cabernet in, in Bordeaux is not a Cabernet here, and it's not a Cabernet, uh, I mean, a Cab in Napa is not a Cab in Sonoma. A Cab in Medoc is not a Cab on the right bank of Bordeaux. So think about all the possibilities for the very same barrel 
to really work differently with the same variable. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing the same cider. I mean, different apples. Yeah. I, I think I think the difference though with cider is that there isn't that same type of foundation okay. that you have in wine. Like you, you know, you talk about that structure in in French. You know, it's been made a certain way, and so you have that lineage that people could fall back on and say, "Well, this is actually where I want to take it." In cider, it's like. A new frontier, which is the most exciting part of it. Exactly. <laughs> and and so well, like, to answer that question is like I, I don't know. The people wouldn't. I, I'm going to make a yeah. guess here. They don't know. I mean, what do you think, Ryan? I mean, what I think. So one of the things I think is really neat about the cider world is that people, cider makers especially, seem really willing to experiment and try new things and try new things and try new things. And most cideries produce maybe not a lot of wine, but a substantial amount of volume and you know a barrels 225 liters or 300 liters if you get a larger format it's a very small like one barrel or two barrels is a pretty small percentage but why not have it be one of the things you try mm -hmm. and then you have time to to figure out what are the questions you have and how to work with them and maybe next year you want a heavier toast than this one or a lighter toast mm -hmm. and it gives you time to build those foundations for your cidery and for your terroir and for the apples you're working on. Mm -hmm. right? And you can build it up um, from the ground yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But see, that's the difference. It's like terroir is a, a new concept for cider in a way. People feel like there's not really terroir in the same way that you could go into a certain region in California yeah. or in Burgundy, or, you know, you know terroir. Oh, I think if you talk to the number of people about cider, they're going to tell you they have tailwalls. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's true. And they also primarily have barrels, and, and they're using, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So in Normandy, yes. In the U.S., no. Not that much? Okay. Look, we did a straight Northern Spy cider this year, and we pulled Northern Spy from two orchards within Prince Edward County. The orchards are about a 20-minute drive apart, and they're farmed by the same guy with the same equipment. Uh, he has a float that he brings the tractors for back and forth with. We kept the fruit separate during fermentation and aging. They're completely different ciders. Like they're same varietal. Same varietal of apple. Yeah. Um, same rootstock, same orchard management, same like everything is the same, except for they're 20 minutes apart by car. Mm -hmm. And the ciders are completely different from each other. One is really, really fantastic. Heavy. I love yeah, that. Yeah, one's one like you, you taste it. You're like you, this must be Perry. And the other one almost tastes like Pinot Gris. Uh, and together they're great. But yeah, yeah, they're yeah. very different ciders. Right, right. I, I, I do believe there's terroir. You know, I've been in the cider world for 20 years, making it and enjoying it in New England, mm -hmm. um, which is really like where commercial cider began again in the U.S. Um, and we do have cider variety apples, as they would, you know, we have more and more. We're seeing it slowly coming in where you're having the cider varieties. Um, but people going for that barrel, they, what I see is folks really want to do it, but they're intimidated because they wouldn't know how to answer that question. They might say, well, I, I just want an oak barrel. They, they, we all love the idea of oak. It's just, there's something about the barrel. It's like huggable. It's like a little poo bear, you know? It's, it's, there is something that is kind of magic in that art, in that, in that industry. Uh, you need time, you need, and you know, you get a chance once per year to try something experiment it and then as you said you know well that toast was a little bit too much or I would like a lighter toast or a heavy toast right. and you have to try the next year so um, in ciders if you are right now in the process of learning those things and, and getting the oak part of the program don't expect that to be you know uh, a fast curve it's going to be a very slow process uh, exchanging a lot of information mm -hmm. combining information um, crossing information from different areas, from different cider makers, from different people involved in that industry, from R&D, from research departments, from... Yes. It's going to be a surprise, process, and the Coopers will be involved, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, where, again, I came to work with Red in 2015, uh, I didn't know anything about those. Um, so right now for us, it's a secondary market, beer, cider, all of that. 
However, we have a lot of interest in that market because, of course, uh, as any company, you know, you look for profitability, you look for growth. And so right now, as you said, you know, Napa, Sonoma, California is, uh, is kind of a plateau. So we look for growth in other states, but also other industries. Mm-hmm. So, uh, mm-hmm. It's the way you look for your, you know, the next steps. That's right. Yeah. Well, Cider's kind of knocking at the door saying, hello, help us. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of the barrels that I see being used by makers right now are, they're bringing them in and they're just... You know, bourbon barrels, whiskey barrels, rye barrels, which are the classic kind of uh, old school kind of, you know, barrels that uh, come into play. Myself, I have a, a barrel that was used in bourbon and then was brought to a brewery and an imperial Russian stout was put in it. And now I have cider in it. And just because I've always wanted to have a barrel. I just wanted to, like, experience that barrel and see what it would do and, and out of that I'm learning so much um, but it's also really daunting too um, and what I notice is some of my questions are the same as some of the makers so here's a question for you that came in from the UK okay this is a guy uh, cidery they use barrels they're award-winning cider cidery um, but his question was what, what happens between the liquid and the oak whether it's you know, wine. What, what is actually going on there? Okay, so actually the question is not ready for me. It's going to be okay, a good. lot better than I am. Okay, good. Well, uh, I think uh, first thing comes first. The barrel is a container. And it's supposed to be tight. In general, mm-hmm. it is. Uh, and so the first thing is it has to contain the wine or the beer or the, or the cider and, uh, uh, and protect it from... Oxidation, Oxidation from yes. being uh, contaminated, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first thing that comes in mind here is that I, although it seems complicated to keep products in a barrel, the, the, the number one rule is as far as as far as the barrel is full, not much will happen. Like it's it's a, it's a pretty safe environment as far as you follow. It. A few rules, just a few rules, and the first one, the very first and easy one, is keep your barrel full, full. at all time. Yeah, no okay. headspace at all. Well, at very then, little. Yeah, and then, then we will. We'll, we'll, oh, okay, <laughs> that's the first rule. Oh, and then, my goodness, then I'll have to call home and say, fill up that barrel. Because <laughs> no. you lose something, right? You, you lose that angel here constantly. Correct, correct. So, the, 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 the first thing is that. If some of your uh, uh, listeners are afraid of, okay, oh, what's going to happen? It's going to I'm going to ruin my product. Mm. If you keep the barrel full, not much will happen. That's okay. the first thing. Okay. okay. Now, even though a barrel is supposed to be a tight container, as you mentioned, it's not completely tight because the wood is porous, naturally porous, mm-hmm. depending on what wood it is, mm-hmm. it's not going to be the same, but it's porous, which means there will be some exchanges. So the product will penetrate the, the wood to a certain extent, mm-hmm. and the air from outside will penetrate inside the staves mm-hmm. as well, and there will be an area where you will have wood, your product, or part of the product, the, 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 the ones that's the most soluble, the, mo- the most able to go through, and the air. So that there is something here going on, mm-hmm. and because there, it's porous, as you said, you will lose what we call the angel share, right? And and so the some of the product will evaporate, and then eventually you will generate some headspace. And now you have an area where some air or some gas will be in contact with the liquid and something will happen here. Mm-hmm. Probably different than what happens inside the staves. Okay, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So, if so stirring it around and all that, I mean, unless there's leaves in it. Well, but then you, that's you a, stop well, that's a different thing. Okay, I know, okay, okay, I'll slow back, okay, all right. Okay. So, <laughs> so, 
that. So we, 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 we started with the container, which, yeah. which is neutral, and then we get to something which is not physically not so neutral because it loses some, right. some, some liquid. And then because it loses some liquid, it, it, it um, let penetrate some, some gas. So it's no longer completely neutral. And then, of course, the wood itself is going to release some extractables. Extractables that are natural from the oak that you can get in any 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 tree, mm -hmm. and extractables that result from the process of toasting, which don't don't exist in in, in the oak that mm -hmm. are generated by the by the bending first of all, and then they found out that by bending it was bringing something interesting, so they added some more fire to do. The toasting. So there is more fire used to make a barrel than just what's needed to make a barrel. A barrel. That's the toasting You're not talking process. about the charring inside, you're talking about the bending of it. So at, at first they found out, they were, I guess the, the Celtics or whoever yeah. <laughs> invented that, they, they found out that in order for the wood to be able to be bent and then to stay the way it is, right. uh, they, had, they had to heat the, the wood. And so that was the, the bending. And then, then they found out that he was actually bringing some toast, some taste to the oak. To the With and no so, okay, charring well, at all? No, with no charring at all at this first. And then of course... In the origin story. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I love this. And then of course, you know, they would make one barrel like this, and then maybe they would forget about the fire, and then, right. oh, gee, right. it's, uh, it's a little bit black, and then you, they would use it anyway, and find that the tastes are different, and maybe some people would like it, some people won't. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing that the, if you look at that, an old winemaking book, uh, I don't remember who it was, but it was like a uh, hundred years old winemaking book, mm -hmm. and they were considering the oak taste as a default. So they wanted to rinse the barrel as much as possible to get rid of that, because wow. they found that was not natural in the wine, and they didn't want that. So, and now, of course, we went to to some certain extent in California to the, 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 the extreme oak, yeah, 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 and and now there is a uh, you know the balance right. comes back to right. something a little bit more balanced yeah. uh, yeah. again, and, uh, and, huh. and so uh, you can find everything in in, in between. So. Yeah. So in that headspace, that have we ordered it? And did, would no. you like to order? Sure. We, sure. we should do that. Yeah. <laughs> to that question of the barrel, somebody um, recently was like, what am I doing with that, like that angel share, and said, well, what about barrel wax? Putting wax on the outside of the barrel to stop evaporation. And they actually, you know, bought some wax. And I know you're, sh you're shaking your head over there. You don't want to stop the evaporation. It's part of the process. Part, part so of you it. have to consider, I mean, Chase going to Talk more, you know, technical, um, technically the means uh, or even Ryan, but um, it's part of the process. So you have to accept that you're going to lose a portion of whatever you're making, cider mm -hmm. or, or anything else. Uh, uh, it seems like a wrong thing to do. Like, do not put barrel wax. It's like sacrilegious. I would, I would be. Yeah. I would be. First of all, uh, the, the, the wax is not necessarily. Uh, um, uh, Tight to to gas and to to vapor. Vapors, yeah, yeah. So it might not work. It might not do. It, might not yeah. just by just putting the wax on. Yeah, might because not work. It's not, the liquid doesn't go out directly. It's not liquid that goes. It's gas. So it's, it just it's, goes it's, gas it's, within as as a, as, in, as in vapor. Yeah. yeah. So uh, probably it would go anyway. Probably. Might, I'm not sure about that. But right. Probably. Interesting. But I think the best way to limit the uh, the angel share is to have a proper humidity in your bar barrel room, and that's something. That's another rule. A barrel room should be at least seventy five percent of humidity. Oh, okay. So that the, the, the oak remain mm. um, not dry outside. <laughs> And so, so can I just talk? Seventy-five percent humidity would be bless you, because um, if in in Normandy or when I'm in those the Shea, right, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a 
kind of a damp, kind of like lower cellar. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't feel like really humid though. It feels just kind of damp and cool. So when that's I think humid, probably quite humid. That's probably quite humid. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just it, trying to yeah, gauge it. Yeah, when it's cool, it doesn't. It's not like when you just step outside today and it's, it's right. in your face. You want that wetness, that kind of wet air mm -hmm. a little bit. That makes sense, absolute sense. Yeah, but yeah. there will be concentration anyway. And uh, as uh, Louis said, it's part of the, of the game. Yeah. But if you, have, if you have a very humid uh, cellar, you will actually lose, you will decrease the, the alcohol level in your product. Oh, because uh -huh. the alcohol, of course, it's, it's all, always a matter of equilibrium. So mm -hmm. there's no alcohol in the... <laughs> in the atmosphere normally so the, right. the alcohol will go out and the water will remain if you have a very dry cellar the water will, the tendency will be to lose more water so you will actually concentrate and, and everything mm. in your products which yeah. can be interesting but of course then it's right. at the cost of losing some volume so. right I think that's the thing about barrels is that with stainless steel you know it's like a set vessel it's very manageable um, but with the barrel, it's a real finesse. You're, you're getting in at a, a level of the, the craft that I find, you know, just totally delightful. It's, it's the, what excites me beyond, you know, words. When I go to any maker and I see that they have a barrel, it's just like, oh, goody. You know, like, now, because there's something's going to happen there that you wouldn't see otherwise in stainless steel. Let's keep on going on with some of these questions here. Of course, right? sure. Um, leaky barrels. What can you do with a leaky barrel? You fix it. Get, you fix it? I mean, is, is, there, is there a way to fix a leaky so, barrel? So you're recording? No, 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 no. Barrels don't leak. Barrels, barrels don't leak. Don't leak. Well, this, this is no, probably, no. I'm, not, I'm sure none of the barrels that Radu makes. No, it, it, no. Of course. I would say it depends, it depends when it's leaking. Is it leaking when people, like, first fill it? And is it, like, is it almost sitting out? Like, is it, is it leaking quickly when people first fill it? Or is it slow over time? Because those are very different things. Well, it, it, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't. Well, it would probably leak if it's been, it's kind of like a wooden boat, right? If it yeah. hasn't been in the water for a while. So it's, it's barrel maintenance. So, yeah, exactly. It's all about the maintenance. The first one is the mechanical issue, and the second one is porosity. The mechanical issue is a leak that is going to happen because you have an issue when we make the barrels, so mm -hmm. when we produce the barrel, when mm -hmm. we, um, and that can happen, uh, you know, you can have a leak on the head, on the throws, between two staves, you have all kinds of problems that can happen, and basically the, the barrel doesn't hold liquid, so that's the problem. The mechanical issues, most of them, 99% of the time, we see them at the cooperage before, because of course we have checkpoints and we, we control the quality of the barrels. So we have at Redoom, for example, we have three different checkpoints, and one of them, we're going to put hot water and, and, and some pressure air in the barrel, and we're going to check on this. Okay? Okay. So mechanical issues, 99% of the time, we see them at the cooperage. Uh, and it's fixed before even shipping the barrel, of course. The sure. barrel is, is going to be repaired. Um, now, you have also a second family of issues, of, of leakers, that is porosity. The porosity can come from two things, dryness. So, the winemaker or the cider maker use the barrel for one year and well, sometimes, and then let the barrel dry, empty, waiting for the next harvest. Right. And unfortunately, maybe it didn't put any water in the barrel so the barrel could recover. So, of well, course. But, it's, but, but putting water in, I always hear like, don't put water in because that will have different bacteria in there too. Well, don't put water for three months. Not but, for you three have, but, but you have to put water before, you know, before you, you are going to fill your barrel again mm -hmm. with wine, cider, or anything mm -hmm. else, or bourbon, to make sure that the barrel is going to yeah, recover. And then, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. So that porosity, worst case scenario, the liquid you're going to put into the barrel is going to do the same thing as water. But if it's wine or cider, you don't want to lose it. You won't. exactly. Right. So at some point, the barrel is going to basically stop uh, leaking, and the porosity is going to be over. Now you have a second issue that could happen uh, mostly on French oak. Doesn't happen American oak. Um, on French oak, your barrel could leak because of a porosity issue, and that one is not going to stop. Ever because you have 
in the channels of the wood, somehow it happens rarely, but it happens. You're going to have a connection between the inside of the barrel and the outside of the barrel through the channel through the wood. So on podcast, it's not easy to see. We would need to draw it, but basically. Uh, the wine is going to start, or the cider is going to find its way, the liquid is going to find its way through the stave. And what, when, once that channel is open, there is no way to stop it. So you have to put a plug, you have to put a wedge on the barrel. So we have ways to stop it in the center if it's a small one. Worst case scenario, if it's really a whole stave that is porous on the large uh, uh, surface, you have to ship the barrel back to the cooperage. The ratio in the industry, we know it, it's, it's less than 2%, so it's, it's rare, and most of the time, out of those 2% of liquors, I would say 9 barrels out of 10, you're going to be able to fix them in the center. We can train our clients, we have kits and tools. It's pretty easy to do, to understand how it works. Um, but liquors, it happens. It's not a big deal in terms of, I mean, if it's mechanical or porosity it needs to be fixed by the cooper, it's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Then it's the responsibility of the maker to maintain the barrel. Maintenance of barrels, it's, it's maybe more, I mean, winemakers, they know. In the cider industry, it's maybe something you're going to get to know, but, you know, if you want to take the long run, with your barrels, if you want to keep them years after years after years, it's not only about it's not only about the dryness and make sure the barrel is not drying out and and, and, and falling apart. Right. Uh, I've seen barrels where the hoops were falling down. Falling down. Okay. Yeah. So uh, and you can see that that is almost impossible to recover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that being said, the maintenance is also about any kind of development. Mm. Bacteria, you know, bacteria, they call, uh, how do you say that? Yeah, bacteria, uh, bacteria, yeah, bacteria, yeah. Uh, or any other components that you don't want to see coming into your product mm -hmm. and yeah. the maintenance. So, you have different ways to do that, but you have to at least get some kind of piece of equipment. Some people use hot water, some people use steam, some people use ozone. So how well, that's one of the questions is how, how you know, how do you wash a barrel? You know, and, and there's the steaming it, that, you know, high pressure steam, right? Back at you. Jimmy's more technical. I think, I think it I mean, matters the, what your scale is. Yeah, yeah. Do you have one or two barrels? One or two barrels, yeah. yeah. Let, let, you yeah. know, let's look at it at the smaller scale because yeah. right now, you sure. know, makers want to get in on it and they're like, well, I'm scared I'm going to invest, <laughs> you know, $1,000 on a barrel, 500 or, you know, whatever it is. And how do I clean it? I think it's good. It's probably a good idea to have a uh, one uh, uh, cleaning head that's actually that's going to spray uh, high pressure water everywhere. Everywhere, and uh, and, and uh, therefore there are two things that if you do so, uh, the second field you have more impact from the barrel, so you you'll get more value out of your buck if you if you do so if, if you don't do so the, the, the wood will be um, kind of uh, plugged with uh, tartrates and, mm -hmm. and, and other facilitates mm -hmm. and so it won't react at all. it won't react oh yes that's that could be a problem that that is one of the things the high pressure head that Thierry is talking about looks fairly similar to a CIP head um, but it's it's a little, it's high pressure instead of just a regular spray ball. Mm -hmm. It's a similar design. Yeah, yeah. So then of course... So, and that's hot water, right, that you're putting in. It should be, is there a certain temperature that you want to typically put that in? So we do about 80 degrees Celsius on our barrel washing program. Do you like a piece of bread? Oh, Please. Mm -hmm. And Louis, would you like some? Thank you. There's also butter here too. I'm gonna to just put this right in the middle yep. so you guys don't have to so on our, reach across. Uh, on our barrel washing program, we usually aim for around 80 degrees Celsius, which is 180 Fahrenheit, something like that. Okay. So pretty warm. But there are other people who do full-on steam, so above boiling. Right. And there are some people who think 80 degrees is too hot because it extract. They're afraid it might extract flavor. So when I was cleaning my barrel. Um, I, I had hot water, I just had a, like a food grade hose and I just 
sprayed the heck out of it because it came from the brewery. It had just been emptied, so it wasn't, it was smelling good. You know, it was just using my nose. It smelled great. I didn't smell any breath or anything like that. Um, I actually liked the smell. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, this is going to be at a nice profile. Um, I also was kind of banking on the magic of the barrel, too. Like, be kind to me, barrel. Don't go too far. Don't mess up. Don't, you know, bring any contaminants. And so far, it's doing okay. Um, so I sprayed it, and I was uh, losing a lot of the char that was inside, because this had been a charred barrel. That happens, right? That's going to happen at a certain point. Do you lose enough where it's, now you're just kind of having a barrel that's just kind of a container barrel, and you're not going to really get any oak profiles, or you need to rechar it again? You should go very far to get to that point. Oh, you would? Okay. Yeah, because the, 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 the water right. will not penetrate very... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you have your cider in the, in the, in the barrel, it's going to take weeks for the cider to get to its maximum penetration. Okay. It's take weeks for it to get to its maximum penetration in the barrel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, this is nice and warm. You have to try some of that. Looks like this. Is it good? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. And here comes the duck wings. <laughs> Little ducklings, it's okay, yeah. Uh, scallions, parsley, and white sesame on top of that. Sounds good. Ooh, yum, yum. Here, I'm going to pass this plate around. So you lose some of the char. Then I, I, I put water in it, you know, see, okay, it held water. Cleaned it out, and I thought, well, then how do I, I'm going to be taking the cider out soon. I, I'm going to do the same cleaning. I'm going to, like, blast it with some water. There's a something called barrel clean that said, oh, you should really do that. But I was like, oh, should I do that? I don't know. Some people say you should use like a blend of citric acid and all these different options. Um, one of the things we watch out for in cider, and I think a lot of makers are concerned about, is it for it going acetic. Of course. Right? And, um, and that could happen really easily. So I thought, okay, well, you wash it out and then put in like a sulfur stick so I could have it sitting dry over the winter? Would that be the ideal way to go? And do I have to worry about it um, imploding? No, when it implode, explode. If there was spirits in it, if I got a barrel that I was cleaning out and had spirits in it, I wouldn't want to put a sulfur stick in, right? That could be... Oh, once it rinse it. Rinse it, no. it's no problem. Because somebody said, watch out, it'll... See, this is some of the rumors that are going around. We're doing a little rumor control here. Uh, once you, once you, because I think they're worried about the vapor. Vapor and having it be explosive once, once from it the. Rains, the vapor should be. Okay. All right. So, sulfur is that is that the kind of classic thing that people would leave a empty barrel in? Just do that sulfur. and. How, how sulfur, long? citric. So the combination of. So water, citric acid, and sulfur. So you add a couple oh, things you, in there. You keep with uh, liquid in it. Yeah. But then that you keep extracting things. Yeah, yeah. So you can do yeah. the other but way. Is, uh, wow. Sulfur wicks. So so you you rinse as much, as well as possible, and you and you empty the barrel. You let it drip as much as possible. Okay. And then you use some um, you, you burn sulfur in it. You which, burn sulfur, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, but it's it's only. Going to last for probably a um, couple months, then no. you have to redo it again. Like if two you, months, would you say two months, and then you want to reburn? It's when we when we burn sulfur, we redo it every month. Every month, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, probably safer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and the, the sulfur discs are um, incredibly inexpensive. So you have to get a little thing to hold the disc. Do you know you know what I use? I was wondering, you know, because I'm. I have a sulfur strip. I have an old uh, coat hanger. <laughs> so you can get, if you get the sulfur disc, they have a drill hole in them. Yeah. That um, perfectly fits on an old steel coat hanger. Mm -hmm. So as long as the coat hanger is not coated, just a piece of steel, uh, that's what I use. Hard to get those coat hangers now. Yeah, you can see them too often You can anymore. even just use steel yeah, wire. Steel wire, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just want to make sure it's not coated because you zinc or something like that is going to melt with the. So you you light the sulfur on the outside of the barrel, yep. then you hang it in. Uh -huh. You you cover the barrel while it's burning, or it needs oxygen for it to continue to burn. Yeah. Cover it. No, just cover it, mm -hmm. let it burn, and then then you pull it out, yep. cork it, 
uncork the barrel or, or plug the barrel? Right. Bung it. Bung it. Bung it. Yeah. Bung, the we'll bung the barrel. I'm bung trying to get the right <laughs> um, vocabulary. And then just let it sit for two months, but you need to do maintenance. You can't let it sit yeah. like that for too long because then it'll start keeping in. So is there a way to rescue a barrel that has gone acetic? Because people say, no way, you can't do anything. It's now part of the, the wood. Well, Is that true? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Mm -hmm. They're, they're shaking yeah. their heads. Yes. In between these spikes of this delicious you, duck you, wing. You might be able to try really hard with some expensive equipment and do something, but it might, at that point, it's probably better just to get rid of it. It would cost you a lot more to try and fix it than to get it out. You couldn't take it apart and reburn it. It's in the wood. Well, you said taking it apart and re. Reheating so and re recharging that, with that. That sounds like a <coughs> smart idea, right? Right. But everyone who's tried that, not everyone. It doesn't work. But a lot of people have tried that, and then some, some companies actually are selling the service. Hmm. But it's important to understand that uh, when the, the oak is toasted at the, at the cooperage, it's fresh season oak. Right. Uh, now, as uh, once you have a product that's been inside and that's extracted uh, compounds, and probably some of the compounds would have polymerized because, as I said earlier, there is the oxygen coming from outside, the wine right. or the right. Right. cider right. Right. coming from in, the wood itself that's going to react. So when you will do the second toast, it's it's no longer the same product. So mm. you'll, you'll have something completely different. Totally different. And it, didn't, it doesn't seem to be working that well because a lot of people who've tried don't do it mm -hmm. anymore, I think. So So if, if the cider is going to go acetic, it's going to happen because of the head space is too gray? Or the barrel's already been not well maintained and well, therefore you get little... Whenever there is a contamination on, on a beverage, uh, it's, there, there is the, the contamination itself, so the, the, the strain that's going to start mm -hmm, growing. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, it all depends on the environment, so the product itself. Uh, does it have the substrate for the contamination mm -hmm. to grow? Right, right. So, of course, if you have residual sugar, if you have low protection, low acid, Right. Um, the contamination will happen. What uh, I mean, no matter what. Yeah. Right. We're, we're not uh, working in, in a sterile environment, right, so right, right, contamination right. will happen anyway. Yeah. Of course, if you have a barrel that's had a lot of contamination, the contamination is so strong that you cannot protect it. So the idea is to have a product that's stable enough so that it will handle mm -hmm. the little mm -hmm. contamination that's going to happen anyway. Hmm. Yeah, so how do you know when you get a, a, it has to be a new barrel, but if you have a used barrel, is there any way to know whether that barrel is a healthy barrel? I would, I mean, maybe this is bad. Maybe. No, no, no. No, I think oh. your nose. I, oh. You smell oh, your nose, okay, yeah, your nose. Your nose. Okay. Your nose. I would also Got it. lean yeah. into, um, it's like a new sexual partner and that you'd want to know their history a <laughs> bit. Mm. So that I wouldn't I, I wouldn't buy barrels blind. I would buy if you're buying used barrels, buy it from the original owner and that you know that they have a good barrel program. Good point. Yeah, that they know what they're doing. So follow your nose or go to the background of the buyer. Okay. Hmm. You need to get as much information as you can get from the buyer. When we sell used barrels, and uh, uh, Red is on my bigger group, and we move a lot of used barrels in this industry. Um, used wine barrels, one field, two fields, and more, uh, to 10 years old, mm. to bourbon barrels, uh, all kinds. Right. Uh, all, all around the world. Uh, we try to get as much information as we can. Mm -hmm 
from the barrels. So mm -hmm. uh, when you buy a second-hand bar barrel, you really need to understand you know, what kind of program, what kind of mm -hmm. red wine, white wine, how many months, and, and then you try to get as much of traceability out of that barrel. So I need to talk to the winemakers, you need to really and, and ask key questions where you're going to see they're telling you the truth or mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you have to check a barrel. Don't don't buy a barrel blind. Never. Yeah. Mm. You have to check the barrels. You have to um, basically go through the. Yeah. You just put your nose in the bay hole and let's see what's in there. Right. If it smells, I was looking for sweetness. I smelled that. I didn't it, smell any off flavor. So I felt most of the most of the um, the main character is. You have to know them, you have to smell them once to understand, but Britomyces, um, TCAs, uh, VAs, all of that, yeah. once you get acquainted to those to those smells, to those flavors, you're going to, I mean, you they're all that VA, you're going to yeah. go, whoa. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of, all of these things, but you need to learn. And then, you know, something sometimes um, pretty easy to do is also get a flashlight and a Take a look inside the barrel. It's not easy. What would you be looking for looking inside? Well, you mold? Look for, right. well, you, can, you can look for mold, you can look for uh, tar, um, tar tar uh, You can look for different things in there, but you're going to see how the barrel has been maintained, if it's clean, if you see, if you see the wood, mm -hmm. um, if you have any components or good things inside the barrels. If you right. have, so, uh, well, of course, you're going to see basically Two-thirds of the barrel, you will never see the top of the barrel. But what is really interesting for you is really to look down in the barrel because yeah. basically everything that has been in that barrel is going to drop mm -hmm. to the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. So if the barrel has something to do but that is mm -hmm. not, well, it shouldn't be here, it's going to be on the bottom of the barrel. Right. Now, the barrel that I received had the hole on the top, on the, on, on the, 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 the head, the drum. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the, on the field. Right. And so it would be like sitting straight up versus on a side. And I was like, hmm, that just didn't seem right to me to like that I'd want to store a barrel upright like that. Oh, so no, so the hole were on the head. Yeah. Was on the on, flat on, on the, the flat, flat side, yeah. Okay, yeah, on the head. So yeah. the barrel was sitting up. Ah, so you probably and, and no holes on the not, on the no, not on the no, not on the staves. Was that and, and it was a, a mm -hmm. bourbon barrel. Or, yeah, bourbon. Okay, yeah. That bourbon. Was bourbon yeah. And then, you know, they just did this for one uh, beer. So what I did was I said, well, you know, it doesn't feel right to me. So I I hit a bung, a wood bung into the that, that hole, and then I drilled into the stave. And I made my own bung hole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seemed like a logical thing to do so that I could have it stored on the side. Is there a difference on storing? Yes. There is. Yes. And what would the difference be? Because you're going to have a greater surface area, exactly. aren't you? Uh, if you have a flat, that's actually a very interesting thing. A flat uh, head, as soon as you lose, you, you, you lack mm -hmm. you know, half a liter or less, mm -hmm. you have the whole surface area that's going to be react mm -hmm. as a oxygenation pickup area. And if you look at the, at the um, traditional containers in different regions. Like I, I'll speak about France because probably that's the one right. I know the, the most. But if you go to Alsace, for instance, where they do white wines, mm -hmm. don't need much oxygen, <coughs> you'll see the casks. First of all, it's mostly larger casks, and they are oval, and mm -hmm. with a bilge which is pretty pretty high. So the uh, mm. it, it, they can lose quite a bit of wine before they get uh, a, a bigger surface area. Now, if you go to mm. Bondol, for instance, mm -hmm. where they make red uh, rosé as well, but also the red wines are more mm -hmm. structured, you will see much flatter uh, casks and, and round, mm -hmm. so you'll get more oxygen. And if you go in an area which is close to where I live in southwest France, which is called uh, Marciac, where they have very green uh, and, and, and needs a lot of uh, mm -hmm. evolution, mm -hmm. The uh, traditional container is almost flat, so again, it's round and flat. So as soon as you you have some wow. some some 
you have a surface yeah. area that's, mm -hmm. that's much bigger. Mm -hmm. Then we might, I don't, I don't know if the difference is that big, but if you look in a burgundy barrel and a border barrel, mm -hmm. burgundy barrel is rounder, and so you have less oxygen than in a border barrel. Mm. And so it's good that I did that. Yeah. Probably. Really good. <laughs> yeah. And it looks right to me. <laughs> but they do that with bourbon then. To, to stir it straight up and down. And with spirits. It, yeah, because it spirit, spirit don't, don't uh, care about oxygen. Mm -hmm. And they, they are a spirit. Uh, actually, we did some trials uh, years ago in Armagnac. And we were looking to, we were trying to find out what what it would do if we were bringing oxygen to the ammonia. Yes. Would it increase the the, the, the aging process mm -hmm. or not? And so we were measuring the dissolved oxygen, the oxygen that was actually in, in the ammonia. And because it's it was high in alcohol, the quantity of oxygen that you can find is pretty high. Uh, I don't know if we can give some figures, but it's mm -hmm. it's 14 ppm. So it's almost double what you would get in a in a wine or or, or a cider, oh, and it was there. So we were trying to add more oxygen, see if it was doing anything, but it was not doing much because mm -hmm. it was there. Then the next step was we added some oak extract, some um, so we were making basically a tea with mm -hmm. the yeah. oak and then yeah, added, like the, picture, yeah. which is something they do traditionally in, sure. in Armagnac, for mm -hmm. instance. Oh. And uh, so you, you start with a liquid that's uh, about the same color as that cider here mm -hmm. from Ryan, pretty clear and clean. And we were measuring the dissolved oxygen and we could see that all the oxygen was scavenged by the oak. So the oak is a strong oxygen consumer. Wow. So over about six weeks, the, the, the spirit with the oak was consuming all, all the oxygen and we couldn't find any oxygen mm -hmm. dissolved. And eventually we started to see the oxygen comes back, coming back. And of course the color also going from the light little, uh, uh, what do you call that, golden thing to mm -hmm. something uh, much darker. Mm. And eventually the reactions was stopping because everything was not oxidized but polymerized. And then we went back to the saturation, 14 ppm, and oxygen was, would not be, uh, would not change anything. So spirits, interesting spirits are yeah. always, except when when they have when they are with new oak, because new oak will take the oxygen, and after that they will always be saturated. Mm. So more or less oxygen is not going to change much. Maybe over years you can lose a little bit more of some of the volatile compounds and something. So I'm not saying it's not changing anything, but it's not oxidizing for sure. So there, there, there's no risk. As soon as you go to beer, cider and wine, it's going to be a different story where you can oxidize those products. Right, absolutely. So can you use a barrel that has gone a little acetic with a spirit? Is that one way to kind of use a barrel? Would would, would Well, I, I don't I don't think you would if you can use. Uh, I mean, clean a, it out a, a little a bit. Barrel infected with Acetobacter for spirits. Oh. I don't think it would you can live in in the well the castor. But would it make you, this? You, you you might seep some out of the wood. Yeah, I, I know that like in, uh, in Bordeaux, for instance, when people are using the oak tank only for fermentation yeah. and they keep them dry there for, for 10 months, mm -hmm. some use uh, spirit, spray spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's more to, it, it's not sterilize, it's not going to sterilize or to remove no. the, if there is a problem, it's going to be there. Yeah. It's yeah. just to prevent from developing. Are you asking if you could like age whiskey in a barrel that yeah. you used to age cider? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Well, if, but but if the cider's gone yes. a little, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you can because uh, because the the, the uh, but if it's not spirit, acidic, though. the spirit producer yeah. use uh, they 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 crave for barrels coming from um, uh, uh, yeah. and so from sherry barrels and things oh. like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, they they don't. No, you can bring something. Anything that, inside, right? right? It's whatever. It's going to kill everything. No, yeah, yeah. We're talking about alcohol. I mean, when it's it's 
coming to the barrel, that is so much alcohol in there. Yeah. No problem. Kill absolutely everything. Okay. I was wondering about the grain. I know you do like the oak scan, right? And the and that, that's about green, isn't it? Uh, not only. But but it it what when you go into like a, an area to get the oak for the barrel, what are you looking at at those trees? Is it the age of the tree? Is it the? I wanted to speak about the that. soil. I think that's part of the magic. It's yes. Uh, oh, I if, like the magic. Yeah, I mean, if if anyone who wants to buy a barrel, and especially if it's a a big uh, commitment, like if uh, you know, if, if you put a lot of your energy and, yeah, your and heart, money and, and yeah. your heart in, in buying a barrel, if you can go to France and go and visit those forests, those uh, bicentennial centennial forests, yeah. yeah, that have been planted. So it's it's natural, but at the same time, it's all built and nurtured. Maybe Ryan could talk about that because we went there. It was three weeks ago, and it so was the first time for you to... It was my first time so. seeing an actively managed forest. And, uh, so it's a managed forest specific for barrels, and, and how old is that forest? So the well, forest is any, anywhere yeah. between 150 yeah. to 200 years old, so 140, 200 years old. Yeah, the, so, each, so each... The forest is broken into blocks. Yeah. So like the, the oldest actively managed block is say 200 years old, but the forest as an entity has been managed long before that. So it was initially used for ships because you needed strong oak and you needed it tall and, and uh, strafed in order to make things like mast and the beams and all that. And then you know they found out that oh yeah we also need the same properties for barrels we want we don't really want knots we want long pieces of, of thick oak that we can use so there's, there's so many cool things about this so I don't want to go too far off mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, mm. the thing that struck me the most is oh, that it's beautiful oh wow, this beautiful look getting the Cornish head that's oh, yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. So, there's four stages of management of the forest. So each phase takes 40 to 50 years. Um, and you figure 40 to 50 years? Per stage, and there's four stages of wow. management. Or, oh, on average. Some <laughs> phases take longer than others. So what really struck me is that, you know, you figure if your career in forestry was 30 years long, it's conceivable that you don't... <laughs> see a whole see lot of change. Wow. Right? Um, yeah, so what I wanted to say is when you buy a barrel, yes. the story of your <laughs> cider has already started 200 years ago. Long time ago. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's just thinking about that. It's wow. Crazy. Yeah. Wow, the story of your cider started 200 years ago. I was, I was ago. going to... <laughs> oh, so yeah, it, nope. starts, it starts two years ago from a fallen apple. Right? But that tree that that tree from that parents' tree was 200 years before that. Yeah. So it's this continual process of parent and daughter trees until your tree. Your tree grows for 150, 200 years. That's right. Um, and then it sits with its, with its neighbors, and each of these small blocks is treated together. So they'll, they'll How close the are the block. trees growing together there? They're managed. Like, you know, we look at an orchard. Um, it starts as wild growth, so it starts with, okay. with wild acorn fall, so it's pretty dense. And then the, we talked about the different phases. Those phases, they're, they're starting to select the trees that will eventually become oak barrels and kind of mm -hmm. clear out the space underneath them. So mm -hmm. that process of selecting the trees takes about 150 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time they're harvested, the trees are maybe 30 feet apart, something like that. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Um, more than that. Maybe, yeah, more 30 meters. 30 meters. Right, they're clearing so, it out. Uh, at, yeah. the, at the very end. At the very end. Yeah, at yeah, the very end. And, and then they're probably trying to grow them very straight, right? Yeah, that's why they, they keep them in uh, a lot of competition. Right, very right. steady. So and then uh, they need more space, and so that also they don't make branches. Right. It's all no on, nuts. on top. No, no nuts. Yeah, no nuts. Yeah. And what's cool is by always by that last stage of the trees always being the straightest ones that were there, 
those are the ones that drop the acorns that form the next ones. Mm. So each generation, the tree is, is taller and shorter. And you're, but, looking, yeah, and you're looking for different oaks. Like I, I think where I live in New England, on my property, I definitely have, you know, really, really old oak trees, big oak trees, a red oak and white oak. Um, but there's particular oak that you want to have. And when you hear like a French oak, what is an actual French oak tree? It's a girls. Yeah, it's a girl. Check your seeds. Oh, it's yeah. yeah, there are actually two varieties. Two, yeah. um, that that uh, that are used and some cross over so mm -hmm. it's, it's pure they can they can um, yeah cross, 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 cross over cross over yeah cross over yeah uh, but those those are the ones that are used in France for French oak right and then American oak is uh, Cactus alba uh, so it's one type of American oak oh. and all the oaks in American in American like I don't think Anybody has made some barrels with uh, California, California oil? No. no. In the history, they tried, I mean, Coopers in the US tried to make barrels with California oak, oregano oak, different ones. But no, at the end, we have only everything is made with Kirkus Alba. So you have Kirkus Alba for here, Kirkus uh, Sicil. Where, where would you get that in America? If where, where is that being grown? If it's not in California? Um, Missouri, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, huh. uh, Northern Oak is coming from Minnesota, eventually Wisconsin, on mm. a small scale, um, the Appalachians. Mm. So, maybe. And the kind of oak it is, can you say it again? What kind of oak? The, um, the actual tree, it's not. Is this a classification of a white oak or a red oak, or is it a... They're all white oak. They're all white oak. Jacques and Black. Okay. Latin. Oh. Hmm. Now, I was wondering, what type of oak barrels do you think they used to go over Niagara Falls? <laughs> That's a very good question. And would that have been a beer barrel, a wine barrel, or like a storage barrel? Like it was a, was a nuts barrel. <laughs> a nut barrel, a <laughs> nut barrel, I know. But I mean, they use barrels. They use oak barrels to go over the fall, and, and some people actually made it. Um, a barrel, the barrel is pretty, I mean, it's pretty strong. It, 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 it's funny because, or funny, not funny, but it's um, some parts of the barrels are extremely strong and some parts are pretty, pretty fragile. Mm -hmm. I don't know the, the term exactly in English, but the, uh, the edges, what's, what's the term in English? The. Pencil? Uh, no. Uh, well, honey, and the edges. The edges are, are very fragile, but the bilge is oh, extremely yeah. strong. Like, if you take a barrel and you let it fall mm -hmm. from 10 feet. Or say, off on the forklift. Or, yeah. Off the forklift, right. Yeah. <laughs> if it falls on, the, on its bilge, it's going it's to rebound. It's going to bounce and, and, and it doesn't break. Even if it's filled with liquid? Sometimes, even if it's filled with wow, liquid. Wow. It can be already impressive. Mm -hmm. But of course, as soon as it falls on the on the side, on the yeah, uh, on the edge, on the edge, then mm. that's very fragile. So. Interesting. I'd like to thank Thierry Lamar of Nuance Trade, Nuance Wine Supply, Inc., and Louis Zanvit of Radeau, a cooperage with a cooperage house based in Santa Rosa, California, and of course, Ryan Monkman, my host and one heck of a cider maker at Field Bird Cider in Wellington, Ontario. 
It was a delightful dinner, and the conversation couldn't have been better. It filled me up completely and just made me searching for even more answers on this quest to discover the oak barrel. If you'd like to contact any of these gentlemen, please go to the show notes for 131. You'll see their contact info there. And do check out the websites because there's a lot more to be said about both their backgrounds and the work that they're doing out there, both for the wine and now the cider industry, both in Canada and worldwide in the U.S. also. done with oak barrels. In fact, next week I am planning to bring to you another episode of Cider Chat on this very topic while I am down in the cellars, the oak barrel cellars with both Ryan and Lee at Kenty Winery up in Wellington in Prince Edward County. So we're going to be hanging up there and I want to roll out a couple of these Canadian episodes that I have are just knocking my socks off, and I hope they are for you too. Uh, but, you know, it's okay because it's sandal season where I am in northern uh, northern hemisphere. Uh, look, I want to give a big thank you both to Ryan and also the patrons of Cider Chat, folks like Current Cider in Percocy, Pennsylvania, who are opening up that fish town location in Philadelphia. It's coming right up. We are wishing them the best of luck. There is also Big Fish Cider Company in Monterey, Virginia. Loving those folks down there. Uh, All these folks are on the podcast already. We also have Ross on Y in the UK. We have not gotten them on the podcast yet, but you know we will. And of course, there's John Edwards from NMR Services doing cider analysis, kind of like technical like this one was. Really good stuff. There'll be a, a a podcast coming up with John, so hang in there for that. And also that amazing cidery in the country of Luxembourg called Ramborn Cider Company. You could listen to the recent episode I had with Carlo Hein. It was a cider dinner chat talking all about the history, just such uh, amazing history in a very small country, but with a very big heart. And you too can become a patron. Just go to Cider Chat's Patreon page. There's always a link in the show notes. And if you haven't heard the news and you're just new to Cider Chat, well, you should know that there is a totally cider tour going to Normandy, France. The last week of September, I will be on it along with some fun people who just want to enjoy cider and pore and calvados and pomo and cheese, go to Camembert, hang out with uh, the DuPont, Domaine DuPont scene, Manoir d'April, watch some cider pressing, look at the countryside, have some time to hang out on the streets in the cafe and have a little uh, demi tasse or something with a side of calvados, if you will. Mm. Yeah, so that's happening. If you want to go, we could fit you in. There's always going to be a little bit of room there. So check it out at the website, ciderchat.com, too. Uh, It's all connected, and I will be on that trip. And I would love for you to come along if you are a fun-loving person who wants to travel and get to know more about cider out there in the world. Ooh, that's my cue to move it along until next week. I hope you have some good times in between now and then. And on Wednesday nights, I always like to consider it a sunset cider club night where we crank the podcast and kick back a few and raise a glass always to you. 
So if that's happening for you, send out a little tweet and do a hashtag Sunset Cider Club. I'll be looking for that and join in the conversation if it moves my way. In the meanwhile, this is Rhea Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Yeehaw!